if you were to open the door of my classroom overseas in the 1960s and look inside, you would say, oh, this looks like a United Nations of little kids, because that's, that's exactly what it was. But when I would come home, back to my own country, the US, I would either be in an all black school or a black and white school, depending upon whether I was in the still segregated or the newly integrated school. And there was not the amount of diversity that I had overseas. Today, you walk into a classroom in the US, people are from all over. But that was not the case in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, when I was overseas, I was literally living about 12 years into the future because that scenario had yet to come to my country. I was already prepared for it when it did. Unfortunately, many of my peers were not. Now, one time when I came back, 1968, I was 10 years of age, fourth grade, and we were in a town called Belmont, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. I was one of two black children in the entire school. Myself in fourth grade, and a little, a little girl in second grade, so I really you know, did not see a whole lot of her, except for at lunchtime or recess. All of my friends were fourth and fifth graders, and they all were white. Many of my guy friends were members of the Cub Scouts, and they invited me to join, so I joined. I was the only black scout in the area. Now, one day we had a parade from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts which is very big in uh, U.S. history. It's the route that Paul Revere rode when the uh, British attacked, yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming. So we were commemorating the ride of Paul Revere. The Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Brownies, 4-H Club, and a bunch of other different organizations, all in this parade. I was the only black participant. Now, the streets were, were blocked off so we could march. The sidewalks on either side were lined with nothing but white people. They were cheering, waving flags, good wishes and all that kind of stuff. And I was carrying the American flag. And I'm marching with my troop. And somewhere down this parade route, there was a group of maybe four or five, maybe six uh, white people on, on my right side. There were some kids, maybe my age, a little bit older, and some adults. I assumed it was kids and their parents. All of a sudden, I was being hit with bottles, soda pop cans, rocks, and debris from the street by this small group of uh, white spectators mixed into the larger crowd. Me being naive, because I'd never experienced anything like this, my first inclination was, oh, those people over there don't like the scouts. I did not realize that I was a target until my, my den mother, my cub master, my troop leader, all came running back and huddled over me with their bodies and escorted me out of the danger. Then I realized nobody else was getting this special treatment it's me. And I was baffled. I said, well, why? why? Why are they hitting me? Why are they hitting me? All they would say is, shh, move along, Daryl. Move along, move along. It'll be okay. Hurry up. They never answered my question. So we all have been 10 years old before. You know, if you have a question at the age of 10, you must have an answer. <laughs> and if an answer is not forthcoming, you begin to make up your own answers to placate your curiosity. So I'm thinking, okay, Maybe it's because I'm the new kid on the block, you know, they're testing me. I had every answer but the right answer. So when I got home, my mother and father, who were not at the parade, were asking me, how did I fall down and get all scraped up? And they're putting band-aids and alcohol on me and cleaning me up. I told them, I didn't fall down. I told them exactly what had happened to me. For the first time in my life, my mother and father sat me down and explained to me the definition of racism. Believe it or not, at the age of 10, I had never heard the word racism. I had no idea what they were talking about. Furthermore, I did not believe them. You know, my parents had never lied to me. If I had a problem or a question, they gave me the answer or the solution, or they gave me the tools of which I could derive the answer or find the solution myself. I did not have big brothers and sisters, you know, to, to learn things from. All I had were my parents. You know, I'm an only child. They got it right the first time. So, <laughs> but for the first time in my, you know, I relied on them heavily. But for the first time in my life, I truly believed they were lying to me. And I didn't know why they were lying. Because I could not get my 10-year-old mind around the idea 
that someone who had never laid eyes on me, someone who had never spoken to me, someone who knew absolutely nothing about me would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than this, the color of my skin. It made no sense. And that group of white people over here on the sidewalk did not look any different to me than my friends overseas, whether they were my little French friends, my Swedish friends, my German friends, or my fellow Americans at the embassy, or for that matter, my classmates right there in Belmont, Massachusetts, and their parents, who treated me rather well for the most part. So my parents had to be lying, and I could not find out why. Well, about a month and a half later, that same year, April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And nearby Boston, uh, Washington, D.C., my hometown, Chicago, Illinois, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Detroit, Los Angeles, Nashville, every major city in the United States burned to the ground with violence and destruction all over this thing called racism. So it was then that I believed my parents, that, it, that this thing does exist. So now I accept that it exists, but I still don't know why does it exist. How can somebody hate me when they don't even know me? And that is the question for which I've been seeking the answer for 50 years. So as a teenager and all through my adult life, I purchased everything I could find, books, documentaries, whatever, on black supremacy, on white supremacy, on the Nazis in Germany, on the neo-Nazis in my country, on the Ku Klux Klan. Anybody who felt that their skin color gave them superiority over someone of another color, I wanted to learn about. Because I knew you were not born with that ideology. It was acquired. Where did it come from? Where is it going? How can it be addressed? But none of my books answered that question. So, I went to uh, Howard University in Washington, D.C., where I received my degree in music. I graduated in 1980, and I've been a full-time musician ever since. In 1983, I was playing in a country band. Uh, country music had made a big comeback in the U.S. There had been a movie called uh, Urban Cowboy with John Travolta and some other people, this mechanical bull and all this line dancing. So all these bars that were playing, whatever they were playing, they switched over to country music. And so country was popular again, right? So as a, as a full-time musician, you know, I wanted to work. So I, I joined a country band. And I like country music. You know, it's relatively easy to play. It's, it's no different than the blues. The blues and country are kissing cousins. The same three chords, just done backwards. So, so in any event, you, you know what? I'm going to just go and turn this off. I think you all can hear me. Can you all hear me? Hold on. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, thank you. I joined this country band, and they, you know, they'd been together for a while. I was new. And they had played this place in a town called Frederick, Maryland, called the Silver Dollar Lounge. The Silver Dollar Lounge was an all-white place. And when I say all-white, I do not mean that black people could not go in. What I mean is that black people did not go in, and that was by their own choice. And it was a good choice, because they were not welcome. Well, here I was in the Silver Dollar Lounge. Now, the band had played there before, but my first time in there. We just finished the set, taking a break, walking over here to go to the dance floor. The band's a little bit up ahead of me. I'm walking behind, and I felt somebody from behind put their arm around my shoulder. And I knew it wasn't the band, but I could see them right there, and I don't know anybody in this place. So I turned around to see who was touching me, and it was this guy, a white guy, 18, 20 years older than me. And he says, man, I really like your all's music. I said, thank you, I appreciate that. I shook his hand, and he pointed at the bandstand. He says, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? I said, well, yes, they have played here before, but this is my first time. I just joined this band. He goes, oh, man, I really like, you know, like your all's music. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. So I'm thinking to myself, I was not offended, but I was surprised that this man, being as old as he was, that he did not know the black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's style of piano playing. 
And I said, I, I wasn't trying to be facetious, but I said, where do you think Jerry Lee Lewis learned how to play? He says, what are you talking about? I said, Jerry Lee learned that style from the same place I did, from black, blues, and boogie-woogie piano players. That's where rockabilly and rock and roll came from. Oh, no, 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 no. Jerry Lee invented that. I ain't never heard no black man play like that, except for you. So I assured him that, uh, yes, Jerry Lee did learn it from black people. I told the man, look, I know Jerry Lee Lewis myself. He's a very good friend of mine. He's told me himself where he learned how to play. The guy did not believe me. He, he didn't believe that I knew Jerry Lee. He didn't believe that Jerry Lee learned anything from black people. But he was fascinated with me, and he wanted to buy me a drink. Now, I don't drink, but I, I agreed to go back to his table. I had a cranberry juice. So he pays the waitress. She gives me the cranberry juice. He takes his glass, and he clinks my glass, and he cheers me. And then he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. Well, now I'm baffled. Like, how, how is this? You know, because I had sat down with thousands of white people or anybody and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. And this guy was probably in his mid-40s. He'd never sat down with a black guy before. And I, I innocently asked him, I said, why? And he didn't answer me. I asked him again. He looked down at the tabletop and didn't answer. Well, he had a friend sitting next to him, and his friend said, tell him, tell him. I said, well, tell me. He looked back at me, just as plain as day, and he said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I burst out laughing at him, because now I did not believe him. Okay? So, you know, like I told you, I, I, I literally have just about every book written on the Ku Klux Klan. I still have them. I have a vast library. And I, I've read them all. And in none of my books does it talk about how a Klansman will come up and embrace a black guy and want to buy him a drink and hang out. It doesn't work that way. So I figure, you know, this guy is jerking me around. So while I'm laughing, he goes inside his pocket and he hands me his Klan membership card. I look at, oh, I recognize the Ku Klux Klan insignia, which is a red circle with a white cross and a red blood drop in the center. It's called a Mayo or a blood drop emblem. I said, ooh, this thing is for real. So I stopped laughing, right? It's not, not funny anymore. And I gave it back to him, and we talked about the Klan and some other things, uh, but he gave me his phone number, and he wanted me to call him any time I was to come back to this bar with this band, because he wanted to bring his friends, you know. His <laughs> Klansmen and Klanswomen friends to come see this black guy play piano like Jerry Lee. And I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll give you a call. And I, I would call him every six weeks when the band was on a rotation to come back there for the weekend. I'd call him on a Wednesday or Thursday and say, hey man, you know, we're gonna be at Down the Silver Dollar Lounge, come on out. He'd come. He'd bring Klansmen and Klanswomen and they would gather around the, the uh, stage and watch me play with the band or get out there and dance to our music. And then on the break, usually I would go over to his table to say hello now, some of them were very curious about me. You know, they hung around, they went to talk to me, shake my hand, whatever. Others would get up and take off when they saw me coming. And they'd go stand in the back of the room, just kind of like, you know, look at me at, you know, from a distance. You know, they didn't want anything to do with me other than watch me. So that was fine. This went on for, oh, I guess to the end of 1983 or so, for a good maybe six months. And then I quit that band. And uh, I went on back to playing rock and roll and R&B and whatever else was going on. But let me show you this. Um, you see the one that says Jerry Lee Lewis? Oh, yeah. I put this one up already. Okay. That's a young one there. That's the killer. Jerry Lee Lewis right there. I didn't have the pictures with me I, 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 at the time that I uh, encountered this guy. And this is a, a later one from a few years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, Jerry Lee and Billy Joel. Um, but I, I could have shown those, shown those to him if I had them at the time. But anyway, I would call the guy to come out and watch him play. But then it occurred to me, you know what? That was my perfect opportunity to get the answer to the question that had been plaguing, plaguing me since I was 10. My question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Who better to ask? than someone who would join an organization, an organization that has over a hundred year history of hating people, 
who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. I should go to that Klansman and get him to set me up with the Klan leader for the state of Maryland. I live in Maryland now. And I'm going to ask the Grand Dragon. Grand Dragon means state leader. Imperial Wizard means national leader. I'm going to ask the Grand Dragon, who I don't know, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And then I'm going to go around the country, ask other Grand Dragons and Imperial Wizards and members, and write a book about it. Because there had never been a book written on the KKK by a black author until mine, from the perspective of sitting down face to face and interviewing these people. There had been two books written by black authors that dealt with the Klan, but each one detailed how he escaped a lynching, one in the 1930s and the other in the 1940s, but not from the perspective of sitting down face to face and talking with their would-be lynchers. So that's what I wanted to do. So I contacted that guy, and um, he didn't have a phone number. He, uh, I, I called the phone, the phone number that he had given me a while back, it had been disconnected. He had since moved, and I'd lost touch with him. Because, I mean, when I quit the band, I had no reason to go back to Frederick and hang out with the Klan. You know, I was only there working. <laughs> so I had to track him down. I got an address on him, but he had no phone. So I had no way of contacting him. So I just showed up at his apartment one evening, knocked on his door. He opens the door. He says, Daryl, what are you doing here? And he stepped out into the hallway and looked up and down the hallway to see if I brought anybody with me. Well, when he stepped out of his apartment, I stepped in. So he turned around and came back in. He goes, what's going on, man? You still playing? I said, yeah, I'm still playing, but listen, I need to talk to you about the Klan. He says, the Klan? I said, yeah, you're still a member, right? Well, he told me, no, he was not, he was not still a member. Uh, he had given it up. And I said, well, where's all your Klan stuff? He says, well, they came. He goes, you mean my Robin Hood? I said, yeah. He says, well, they came and got it. I said, what do you mean they came and got it? Don't you own your Robin Hood? And he went on to explain to me, which I found out to be true later on, that when you join the Klan, if you can afford it, you pay for the Robin Hood, and it's yours to keep. Take it home, it's yours. If you cannot afford it, you can still take it, but you put extra money in every dues period until you pay it off. So he had not quite paid it off, so they came and repoed his Robin Hood. <laughs> so. He told me that when they came to get it, he could not find the mask, you know, that went, you know, under the hood to cover the face. But he has since found it, and he needed to return it. I said, let me see it. He went down the hall to his bedroom or somewhere, and he returned and handed me this mask. I'm looking at this thing. I said, listen, man, do you know Roger Kelly? Yeah, I know Roger. Roger was my grand dragon. I said, well, listen. I'm writing a book on the Klan. I want you to introduce me to Roger Kelly. I want to interview him. Oh, Daryl, I can't do that. Well, why not? Oh, man, I can't take a black man to the Grand Dragon. I said, but you say you're not in the Klan anymore. He goes, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I don't want to be in danger. I don't want to put you in danger. So I said, look, you said that you need to return this mask. He says, yeah. I said, give me Roger Kelly's phone number and address, and I will go to his house, and I'll return it for you. He snatched that thing right out of my hand and said, no way. And he was serious. So I begged and pleaded with him to give me Roger Kelly's phone number and his address. He finally gave it to me on the condition that I not tell Mr. Kelly where I got his personal information. I said, okay. And then he warned me. He said, Daryl, do not go to Roger Kelly's house. Do not fool with Roger Kelly. Roger Kelly will kill you. And he was very concerned about my safety. I said, well, I'll figure out something, but I need to interview Roger Kelly. So I left. And I had my secretary, her name is Mary. I had her, who, and she's white. And I only mention that not because I care, but because it's part of my story. I mention it uh, because I could have called Roger Kelly myself. I'm the one who had the phone number. But I did not want to call Roger Kelly because I was afraid, uh, you know, this guy said, you know, that Roger Kelly would kill me. So obviously, you know, he does not like black people. Um, I did not want him to pick up in my voice on the phone that I'm black. That he might say, I'm not talking to you, click. And then my whole, my whole project would have ended before it ever got started. But I figured if Mary called him, he would know by her voice that she's white. And he would not automatically assume that this white woman is working for a black man, especially a black man who's writing a book on the Ku Klux Klan, because they did not exist. <laughs> so 
That way he might be more agreeable to meeting with me. And if he did, obviously he would see that I'm black when he met me. And uh, so that's what I wanted. And plus, furthermore, if, if he knew in advance that I was black, he might, and he agreed to do the interview, he might have different answers to a black interviewer than he would have to a white interviewer, especially if he had time to prepare. So I wanted everything to be spontaneous. So I told her, I said, Mary, do not tell Mr. Kelly that I'm black. If he asks, don't lie to him, but don't give him reason to ask. She said, okay. So she called him, told him, you know, she's working for somebody who's writing a book on the Klan. Would he consent to sitting down and being interviewed? He said, yeah. He said, fine. So, skip ahead. He didn't ask what color I was. We set it up. We went to the motel that was above the Silver Dollar Lounge in uh, Frederick, Maryland. We got, we got a room several hours before the time for Roger Kelly to come. And I gave Mary some money. I sent her down the hallway to the soda machine to get some, some soda pop out and put it in a bucket of ice, get it cold, because I wanted to be hospitable when Mr. Kelly arrived. I had no idea what this man was going to do when he saw me. Would he attack me? Would he say, I'm not talking to you, and turn around and walk away? Or would he come in my room and do the interview? In any event, I was going to be hospitable and say, you know, would you care for a cold beverage? So I had all this soda getting cold on the ice in the bucket. And uh, the way the room just happened to be, if you people are standing in the hallway of this motel and the doorway is here, you cannot see who's in the room from the hallway because the room is back here. You have to come in, turn to your right, and the room is back here. So there's a wall here, right? You cannot see. I took the lamp table, took the lamp off, put the table back here in the most obscure corner of the room. I put a chair on one side for Mr. Kelly, a chair on this side for me. And I had a bag beside my chair that had a cassette player. I put it in the middle of the table, all in hopes that Mr. Kelly would come in and he would let me record this interview. I had some blank cassettes, and I had a copy of the Bible in my bag because the Ku Klux Klan claims to be a Christian organization. And they claim that the Bible preaches racial separation. So I want to be prepared to pull out my Bible and say, here, Mr. Kelly, show me chapter and verse where it says in the Bible that blacks and whites must be separate. So I'm all prepared. Right on time. We were scheduled for 5.15. Right at 5.15, I'm seated back here at my table. Mary hops up, runs around the corner, and opens the door. In walks what is known as the Grand Nighthawk. Nighthawk in Klan terminology means bodyguard, security. A Grand Nighthawk is a bodyguard to a Grand Dragon. An Imperial Nighthawk is a bodyguard to an Imperial Wizard. This uh, Grand Nighthawk walks in. He's wearing military camouflage. Right here, he had that Ku Klux Klan patch, that red circle, white cross, blood drop. Over here are the letters, KKK. He had a little barrette on his head, embroidered. It said, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And right here, he had a semi-automatic handgun. Well, he comes in, and Mr. Kelly is walking directly behind him in a dark blue suit and tie. The Nighthawk turned the corner and saw me and just froze. Well, Mr. Kelly did not realize that his Nighthawk stopped short, and he slammed into his back and knocked him forward. And so, you know, they're stumbling around, you know, regaining their balance, and they're like, you know, looking all around the room. And I'm just sitting there at my table looking at them. <laughs> And I can see in their faces, I could tell what was wrong. You know, they're looking for a white guy. And they got me. And their faces, you know, told the whole story. They were wondering, did the desk clerk give them the wrong room number? Or did they misunderstand the number? Or is this an ambush? I could see all this apprehension. So I stood up and I went like this to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked forward and I said, hi, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. He shook my hand. The Nighthawk shook my hand. So far, so good. I said, Come on in, come on in, have a seat. Mr. Kelly sat down. Everything was going smooth. And the Nighthawk stood at attention to his right. And I was getting ready to sit down opposite him when Mr. Kelly said, Mr. Davis, do you have any form of identification? I said, sure. I gave him my driver's license. He said, oh, you live on such and such street in Silver Spring. Well, now that had me concerned. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, why, why is he looking at my address? All he has to do is look at my name, look at my picture, look at me, match him up, and give him back my license, right? Here he is quoting my address, a street. 
And so I'm, I'm a little concerned, you know, is he planning on coming to my house and burning a cross or what? But I, I did not want to let him know that he had raised concern with me, but I wanted to let him know, don't come to my house. <laughs> because if you do, I'm going to come and see you, right? So I said to him, I said, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where I live. And you live at, and I named his house number and his street. So I was leveling the playing field. So I was letting him know if he came to visit me, I would come visit him. So we're going to confine all of this visiting to this motel room. So he smiled, he nodded his head, he understood. I did not find out until months later that I had been presumptuous. I had no reason to fear Mr. Kelly coming to my house. I found out one of his clan members lived right down the road from my house. I did not know that. And Mr. Kelly had to travel down my street to get to that guy's house. It was pure coincidence, that's all. He recognized the street name. But I had no way of knowing that that particular day. So today, that same Klan member sits in a federal prison in the state of Maine for committing a hate crime. So anyway, we got on with this interview. Within a few minutes, Mr. Kelly let me know that I am inferior that black people have smaller brains than white people, that black people are prone to crime, that black people are lazy, don't want to work, we try to scam the government welfare system. You name the stereotype, I heard it. But you know what? He's sitting right across from me. Now, a lot of people will get very angry and get you know, on, on the verge of violence to, to, to be insulted like that. But you know, I'm telling myself, while I'm hearing all this, this man obviously is not talking about me because he does not know me. All he knows is the color of my skin. A, I don't have a criminal record. B, I've never been on welfare. I work, I'm a musician and I'm paid. So that's my job. And, uh, and, and C, I have more education than him and all of his clan put together. So obviously he's not talking about me. Now, are there black people who fit that stereotype? Of course there are. But for every black person that you can find that fits that, I can find 10 white ones. Because black people only make up 12% of the United States. <laughs> so yes, every, everybody can, can find somebody who fits that stereotype. So anyway, I let him ramble on and on. But every time, you know, some things, some things he would say I would agree with, other things I would disagree with. But you know, when he would say, you know, Mr. Davis, the Bible says, and I'd pull out my Bible, give it and say, show me chapter and verse. He'd find something and read it to me. Or if my cassette uh, player ran out of tape, I'd reach down, pull out my, you know, fresh cassette. Well, every time I reached like this, the Nighthawk reached like this. And after a while, he realized there was no threat in the bag. I understood what he was doing. You know, that's his job. He's there to protect his boss. And he, he doesn't know me. And here, here I am reaching inside this bag, and he has no idea what's in the bag. So he's doing his job. I got that. And after a while, he relaxed. I went in and out of the bag. You know, he didn't even move. So we're going along talking. And just over an hour into this interview, there was a very fast, quick, strange noise, kind of a And we all jumped. And I flew out of my seat. I came up like this because I was getting ready to jump across the table and attack. Mr. Kelly and the Nighthawk. And I'll, I'll explain that to you in a second. When I heard the noise, I, I feared. I feared for my life. Because in that split second, I, you know, it, it, it didn't last. It was a, a very fast noise. I could not figure out what that noise was. You know, and I had to react. Um, a, you're already in a situation where somebody doesn't like you. I mean, after all, this man is, is, is the head of the clan and I'm a black guy. And then I'm told by this other Klansman who gave me the information that Roger Kelly would kill me. So I'm fearing for my life. And then this man is making some weird noise that I cannot explain. Now, how did I know that he made it? I knew he made it because I didn't make it. So if I didn't make it, he had to have made it. So I'm using process of elimination. And when you go, you know, when you fear for your life, you go into survival mode. And you can only do four things, one of four things, when you're in survival mode. Some people 
depending upon the level of fear, they will pass out. They'll faint, fall out and pass out. I don't faint. Another thing people will do is their muscles will, will constrict. They'll ball up and, and, and just freeze like this. And you can be taking a baseball bat and hitting them on the head or kicking them. They will not be deflecting the blows. They'll just be like this. That is called paralysis by fear. It's a real thing. Their muscles they just get too scared and their muscles tighten up and they cannot move. They're immobilized. I don't do that either. The third thing that some people will do is to run away. That is the best option, to put as much distance between yourself and the source of your fear as quickly as possible. Separate yourself. And that's exactly what I would have done if I had the opportunity. A, I am not armed. I had no weapon. Mary had no weapon. The only person who I knew for sure who had a gun was a Nighthawk, because you could see it. You know, he's open carry. I did not know if Mr. Kelly had a gun up under his suit uh, jacket or not. But all I knew was, they're armed, I'm not. And you cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. So running was not an option. So when I came up, I was ready to, to dive across the table, grab Mr. Kelly, grab the Nighthawk, and slam them down to the ground, and take away the Nighthawk's gun. Now, like I said, I did not know whether or not Mr. Kelly had a gun or not, but, but simply because he was there, uh, I, I was not going to take any chance. I was going to put him down as well. So when I came up and hit the table, I'm looking right into his eyes. And I did not say a word. My eyes were speaking for me. My eyes were asking him, what did you just do? His eyes had locked with my eyes. I could read his eyes. He, he didn't say a word either, but his eyes spoke loud and clear. His eyes were saying to me, what did you just do? And the Nighthawk was like this, looking at both of us, like, what did either one of y'all just do? <laughs> well, Mary, she was over here to my left, sitting on top of the dresser. She realized what had happened. The ice in the ice bucket had melted, and the cans of soda fell down the ice. And that's what made that noise. That and it happened again as she was explaining it to us. And we all began laughing. All of us. Yes, he's the head of the clan, I'm a black guy. But we, we, had, we had this common laugh. And th this was a teaching moment. I will not say that it was a learning moment at the time, but it was a teaching moment. The lesson taught is this. All because some foreign, underscore, circle, highlight the word foreign, entity of which we, were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice, Kansas soda, entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, we became fearful of each other because we didn't know what it was. Ignorance breeds fear. We fear the unknown. If you do not keep that fear in check, that fear in turn will escalate and breed hatred because we hate those things that we fear. We hate those things that frighten us. If you do not keep the hatred in check, that hatred will escalate and breed destruction. We want to destroy the things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? They may have been harmless and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain almost un unravel to completion. We stopped short of the last component, the destruction. Had the Nighthawk pull out his gun and shot somebody, namely me or my secretary doing his job, or had I passed across the table and hurt one of them doing my job to protect me and protect my secretary. However, if you all watched the uh, news <clears throat> last year in the US on, uh, on August 12th, two hours from my house in Charlottesville, Virginia, where these white supremacists had a, had a rally, uh, you would see that whole chain unraveled to completion. In Charlottesville on August 12, 2017, there was a lot of ignorance down there. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of hatred. And it culminated in what? Destruction. When a white supremacist got inside his car and drove it through the crowd of protesters, trying to kill as many as he could, he injured 20 
and succeeded in murdering one girl, Heather Heyer. So ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. So we got on with this interview, and there were no more incidents. You know, we interviewed, everything was fine. At the end, I thanked Mr. Kelly for his time, I shook his hand, and he wished me luck, he told me to keep in touch. I thought to myself, keep in touch? <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I came here to make friends. You know, I, I came to find out how can you hate me, you know, when you don't know me. But I, you know, I was polite, I said, Mr. Kelly, I have other clan people I want to interview, um, but I will give you a call when my book is ready for publication. He said, okay, good luck, and off, you know, they go. So on the way home, let me just grab a little sip of my water here. Um, on the way home, I said to Mary in my car, I said, you know, I rather like Roger Kelly. Well, her head almost hit the ceiling of my car. She goes, what do you mean you like him? He doesn't like you. I said, yeah, yeah, I know. She goes, what do you like about him? I said, listen, I don't like what he stands for, but I like him as a person. In fact, we have more in common than we do in contrast. Most of what we had in contrast centered around how we each felt about race. He felt he was superior, I was inferior. I felt I was equal. He felt the races had to be apart. I felt they could be together. But other than that, we agreed on many things, except for when it came to racial issues. So I said, you know, I'm gonna stay in contact with the guy. I began calling, you know, I was interviewing other clan people as well. Some would talk to me, some would not talk to me, some wanted to fight me as soon as they saw me because they didn't know I was black, you know, and things like that. But I'm gonna tell you about Mr. Kelly tonight. So, I would call him and, and invite him to my gigs anytime I had a gig up near his area. He'd come, he'd bring his Nighthawk, and he'd watch me play, he'd get out and dance, and um, I would invite him down to my house. He, he lives about an hour and a half from my house. He would come to my house with his Nighthawk. Nighthawk would sit on my couch next to him. Sometimes the Nighthawk would get bored. He'd pull out his gun and twirl it on his finger like this <laughs> while Mr. Kelly and I are talking. And so, you know, sometimes I would invite over some of my black friends, some of my white friends, some of my Jewish friends, just to engage Mr. Kelly in conversation with someone other than me. I didn't want him to think, oh, Daryl's an exception. No, he needs to talk to other people as well. So we would do this, we would even eat lunch or dinner at my dining room table. Now this is me, I, I'm an inferior person, and he's inside my inferior house eating my inferior food, right? <laughs> so, or you, know, or, you know, we would go out and eat. This went on for two years. And by the end of two years, he was coming down to my house by himself, no Nighthawk. That's how much he trusted me. He never invited me to his house. After two years, he got promoted from Grand Dragon, state leader, to Imperial Wizard, national leader. He began inviting me to his house. And I go to his house, I see his clan den where he'd have his clan meetings, I take some pictures, take some notes from my book. And then he began inviting me to clan rallies. I go to these clan rallies, there'd be these clansmen and clanswomen in their different color robes. They'd make a big wide circle around this big wooden cross. And the cross has been wrapped in burlap. The burlap has been soaked in what they call clan cologne, which is actually diesel fuel, kerosene. And they make this big circle and they have these torches. And they march, you know, clockwise around this cross. And one of the leaders, the Grand Dragon or Imperial Wizard, will say, clansmen, halt! And they'll all stop. And then he'll say, for my God. And they'll all repeat, for my God, and bow. For my race, for my race. For my country, for my country. For my clan, for my clan. White power, white power. Right? Clansmen approach the cross. Then they close the circle in, and now they're at the base of the cross. Clansmen light the cross. And they throw their torches down at the foot, and then whoosh, this cross is aflame. And they stand there and they admire the, the burning cross and then they give some speeches and other things and then the rally is over. So I took pictures of this, took more notes, and CNN, the cable news network, uh, they got wind of this. They knew who I was through music because I spent you know, 32 years playing piano uh, for the man who invented rock and roll, the great Chuck Berry, who passed away last year. So they knew who I was through music. They knew who Roger Kelly was through the, uh, through the Klan. And they thought, you know, this is very interesting, a black musician and a Klan leader. So they called me and wanted to do a story. I said, okay. They said, well, when's the next time you're going to a rally? I said, I'll call you. 
So opportunity came. I called CNN. I said, okay, I'm going to a rally on Saturday, whatever the date was. They said, okay, cool, you know, we want to come. Uh, are you performing anywhere the night before, Friday night? I said, yeah. So they wanted to come to my gig and film me doing what I normally do, which is play music. So they came to the gig Friday night. They filmed the band. Saturday morning, CNN came to my house, and they followed me two hours up the road to this Klan rally. And they said, do you think Roger Kelly will even talk to us? I said, I'll do better than that. When the rally is over, I will speak with Mr. Kelly, and I will get him to come back to my house. And you can interview the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan inside a black man's house. They said, oh, OK. <laughs> so they filmed the entire rally. When the rally was over, I spoke with, with uh, Mr. Kelly, and I told him what was up, and he agreed. He drove two hours out of his way down to my house with no Nighthawk, just by himself, and he sat in my basement and interviewed with CNN. And this clip was shown on CNN and on HLN every hour for 24 hours all over the world. And I'm gonna show it to you right now, but I want you to pay particular attention to what Mr. Kelly says. He says that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for many years. And he goes on to say how he believes in separation of the races because he finds that to be in the best interest of all races. But then listen to what he says towards the end of the clip about respect. Very interesting. And then check out the commentary that the two CNN uh, news desk anchor people uh, make about it. Okay. <laughs> so that's the clip. And uh, that clip enabled me to get a publishing deal. And the book came out. Um, and a lot of articles came out and things like that. Then eventually a documentary came out. The book is called Clandestine, spelled with a K, not a C, Relationships. Clandestine Relationships. And the documentary you can find on Netflix called Accidental Courtesy. But more importantly, you heard Roger Kelly say that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan. Because his views on the Klan were what? Cemented in his mind for years. And he went on to say how he believes in separation of the races. Because he finds that to be in the best interest of all races. But then towards the end there, he said something very, very interesting. He said that he respected me. Did y'all hear him say that? What's that all about? When I first met him, I was inferior. I had a small brain, and I didn't work, and I'm a criminal, and all kinds of stuff. Now the imperial wizard, top man of the Ku Klux Klan, respected me. This is very important. If you don't take anything else home tonight, take those words home and apply them in your daily life. And let me show you how. He said, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Those are his words. Very, very important. If you have an adversary, somebody with an opposing point of view, it may be so extreme, it cuts you to the bone. And trust me, at some of the Klan rallies I've been to, I've heard things that cut me to the bone. All right? Give that person a platform. Allow them to air their views. If you agree with them, fine, no problem. If you don't agree with them, it's still fine, no problem. You challenge them, but you do not challenge them violently or rudely. You listen to them, and then you say, look, I need more clarification as to why you think I should believe this way. Give me more explanation. When you do things like that, there is an excellent chance that they will reciprocate and then give you an opportunity to present your platform. You make sure that you have done your homework so that you can present your platform in an influential and intelligent manner. Because at the end of the day, you each must think about what the other person said. And if somebody says something to you that goes against what you have believed from day one to however old you may be today, but, you, but a little spark happens and you think, hmm, you know, she does have a point there you might begin leaning in her direction. So that's important to sit and listen and exchange information. We spend too much time talking about each other or talking at each other or talking past each other. Let's spend more time talking with each other 
even if we don't agree. All right? I have this theory. When two enemies are talking, they're not fighting. They're talking. They might be yelling and screaming and maybe beating their fists on the table, but at least they're talking. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So you want to keep the conversation going. You have people who are ignorant, and you have people who are stupid. Some people want to define ignorance and stupidity as being synonymous. I do not. To me, an ignorant person is someone who makes a wrong decision or a bad choice because he or she does not have the facts or the proper information to make the right choice. If you give them the proper information and the facts, they can make the right choice, and you have alleviated the ignorance. A stupid person is someone who has the facts, who has the proper information, and they still make the wrong choice. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I have a room, right? And I paint the walls of the room. I do not post up any signs that say wet paint. Therefore, anybody coming into that room is ignorant, unaware of the fact that these walls are wet. And they might go and lean up against the wall, and now they got paint on their clothes because they didn't know. So I, I can cure that. I can fix that. I can put up signs that say, wet paint, stay off the walls. I can stand in the doorway, tell each person coming in the door, hey, gather around the center. I just painted these walls 10 minutes ago. They're still wet. So now everybody has the facts. Everybody has the proper information, yet somebody still comes and leans up against the wall, and now he wants to know why is there paint on his clothes. It's because he is stupid, okay? <laughs> he had the facts, but he went and did it anyway. Fortunately, there is a cure for ignorance. That cure is called education. Unfortunately, there is no cure for stupidity. If you give somebody the education and they don't use it, there's nothing you can do until they employ that education. So, Mr. Kelly and I will continue. Now understand something. I am not a supremacist. I'm not a separatist. I'm not a nationalist. I'm not a racist. I did not respect what Roger Kelly had to say. I did not respect what Roger Kelly had to say. But I respected his right to say it. You understand the difference, right? So that's very key. And that's what he was saying. He said, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Those were his words, not mine. His words. Take those home with you. Because over time, we continued these conversations. He and I would go out and have dinner. Sometimes we would talk about the Klan. Other times we'd talk about nothing to do with the Klan. We'd talk about the latest James Bond movie. He'd seen it, I'd seen it. We'd compare notes, whatever. Over time, that cement that held his ideas together in his mind began to get cracks in it. He began thinking about some of the things that I was saying. And they made more sense than what he had been believing for years and years. He began struggling, and that cement began cracking. Because, you know, you've got to make up your mind. Do you want to continue living a lie, or do you want to turn yourself around and live the truth? So over, t over more time, the cement would crack and crumble and then uh, fall apart. So a few years back, Mr. Kelly quit the Ku Klux Klan. He no longer believes in what he said in that videotape. And when he quit, he gave me his robe and hood. This is the robe of the Imperial Wizard. This is the same robe that you saw him wearing in the video. This is the uh, clan member. Everybody, every clan group uses every clan member. So this is the robe of the Imperial Wizard. Of course, this here is, oh, is the, uh, the hood. It's also called a helmet. Either name, hood or helmet. This is the hood. This is the mask. Members who want anonymity, they don't want you to know who they are. They wear this mask, which is attached to the hood, and they peep at you through these eyelets. So they see you, you don't see them. If they don't care that their identity is revealed, the mask is attached with three snaps and or Velcro. They just detach the mask, 
and the face is exposed under the hood. And you saw both, uh, both types in that, in that video, people with their faces covered, people with their faces exposed. I have between 45 and 47 robes and hoods given to me over the years. I have a ton of other stuff as well, not just robes and hoods, but I have about 45 or 47 robes and hoods. Um, but over 200 Klansmen have quit, and, and women, as a result of me being the impetus through conversation. And this is how I get it, through conversation. Not talking at, not talking about, not talking past them, but sitting down talking with them. Now the two CNN anchor people, uh, they implied that I was strange or something. Well, I'll tell you what, if being strange gets people to give up stuff like this, we all need to be strange, you know? And I, I was telling Sam here, about three weeks ago, I went to a Klan rally in uh, South Dakota. And this is a, um, there it is. Let me see. You can barely see me in the background there. That was right after they set, set the cross on fire. So I asked them if they posed for a picture with me, which they did. Um, and how do we get back to the menu? Yeah. This is one from a while back. That was three weeks ago. This is one from a while back in Maryland. So you, you can see I've been doing it for a while. I'm, I'm a little bit younger there. <laughs> Had more hair on my head, right? And um, that's from Missouri. Uh, a couple years ago, where I was talking with them. That's another one uh, in, uh, in Missouri. Now, so what am I doing today? Uh, you know, it's, it, it continues, the work continues. I mentioned Charlottesville. Uh, that took place last year, and they had a, a, a reunion, a Unite the Right rally this year, which was a real flop in, uh, in D.C. But let me show you something here. You may have seen uh, in the footage that, uh, that you saw from last year's Unite the Right. Uh, let, let me set it up for you first. You're going to see a, a black fellow with a, a flamethrower. Uh, it's an improvised flamethrower. It's an aerosol can, and he lit a match, and he's you know, shooting a flame. The people coming down uh, these stairs from this park, where there's some Confederate statues, the people coming down the stairs are, are Klan members. They're not in their robes and hoods, but I know them. They're Klan members. And he's aiming this uh, flamethrower at them. Meanwhile, another Imperial wizard in the Klan is coming around, and he sees him doing this, and he pulls out a gun and aims it at him. And then he yells at him, and then he fires the gun down by his feet. And then he walks away. And you're going to see the Charlottesville police, who are standing right there, right there, just 10, 15 feet away, watching this and hearing the gunshot, standing there like this, doing nothing. They're wearing green, you'll see them in riot gear. That's the Imperial Wizard there. <laughs> See the cops in the background there in the green? There they are. All right, run, run, run it again. Chief of police got fired over that because he ordered his police to stand down and not do anything. Okay? There's a whole discussion about that that I can tell you about, but it would take too much time. 
But anyway, I, you saw what I want you all to see. That's the type of ignorance, fear, hatred that led to destruction in Charlottesville last year. Somebody could have been killed. That's a live bullet. They dug the bullet out of the ground for evidence, OK? I know that guy, that imperial wizard. I called him up. I said, look here, man. You and I need to talk, you know, talk about this. I want you to come down. There's a new, there's a new museum in Washington, DC that just opened up about a year and a half ago. It's the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. You're getting ahead of me there. Um, so I wanted him to come down to my house. I wanted to talk to him. And I wanted to take him on a tour of that museum. So he agreed. He came down to my house. I took him down to the museum in my car. That's his fiance there. And he's wearing his Confederate flag uh, bandana into this African American uh, museum. So we, uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, I have some other ones, but uh, anyway, um, here is as we left, we, we toured the museum and then we left the museum. So I am planting seeds. This is how it works. This is how it works. You know, you have to, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk. So I'm spending time with this guy, trying to re-educate him on his own history. He's an American, just like I am. And we have to live together. He needs to learn about American history. And I am a part of American history, whether he likes it or not. We are intertwined. So I'm going to spend time working with him and re-educating him, all right? So he was getting married a week after that. That fiance that you saw in the museum with him, she's a clanswoman. She asked me if I would walk her down the aisle and give her away to him. And he asked me the same thing. There we are, OK? And then there's a, yeah. There you go. So building a relationship. These are things that I do on a regular basis. And it comes from spending time with people. I know who I am. People can say whatever they want to say about me. And I've been called every time I name in the book by people who look like him and by people who look like me. But I know what I'm doing as a result of that robe right there and 46 or 47 other ones and, and 200 people leaving as a result of me being the impetus. It's about respect. You don't have to respect what somebody says but respect their right to say it. And be willing to sit down and, and have a conversation. Now, I, I, I'm talking about race here tonight, OK? But you can apply that with anything you want. In fact, let's take race off the table. There are many other hot topics. For example, you all just uh, legalized uh, marijuana, I understand, today, OK? So there's a hot topic. <laughs> Abortion, global warming, um, any number of issues. You're on one side, somebody else is on the other side. Give your adversary a platform. Allow them to air their views. And listen to them. Because you cannot address them unless you know where they're coming from. You don't have to agree with them, but, but educate yourself about their position so that you can talk with them in an intelligent and influential manner. And, and put, plant seeds in their mind so that they have to struggle with those belief systems. And that's how that results. 